<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Howard Rome with the Strategy Management Group in the uh, Balanced Scorecard Institute, and I'm joined by uh, Joe DiCarlo, Senior Vice President and Senior Consultant at the Strategy Management Group and Balanced Scorecard Institute. Uh, Joe, it's uh, nice to be on the same platform uh, with you again. It's been, uh, it's yeah, been, a, it's been a long time. <laughs> Good to be back together. Yeah. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, our uh, strategic partners, uh, George Washington University uh, helps us with uh, certifications when we do our training courses. And uh, we're also uh, partners with the uh, Project Management Institute and the uh, International Association for Strategy Professionals, a group we've been involved with for, uh, for many years. Discover the power of strategy execution. <clears throat> Um, we're recording the uh, webinar, so we'll email you a link uh, so you can uh, uh, replay it if you want. I think uh, within uh, two days is our goal. And we'll also provide you with a PDF copy of the webinar when we uh, you know, email the link. Um, we've been requested to use the Q&A box so we can uh, manage the questions better uh, rather than the uh, chat box. So <clears throat> if you have uh, a question or a comment, please uh, please use that. Um, topics for today, uh, something called strategy execution imperatives. Uh, uh, Joe and I, between us, uh, have been doing this for a long time, traveling the world, uh, probably uh, close to 100 countries uh, between the two of us. And um, what we found in our uh, travels is that, uh, you know, we can group things that work for strategy execution, and we can group things that don't work so well. Uh, and we call the things that... Uh, uh, the, the categories that we want to focus on to help an organization improve performance imperatives. And there are five imperatives, and that's really the basis of this uh, webinar today, five strategy execution imperatives. Um, for, for each one of the imperatives, we're going to talk about some issues and challenges that we've observed, uh, some possible actions to get the results that, uh, that we want, and then uh, share uh, examples and, uh, and stories as, uh, as we go through it. Uh, I'm the guy on the left, uh, Joe's the guy on the right, <clears throat> and I, as I mentioned, uh, we've been uh, doing this for, uh, for, uh, for quite a while, both in the private sector, public sector, quasi-government, uh, nonprofit, and uh, many uh, international organizations as well. Um, I understand from Candace that we have uh, 83 countries represented in the uh, webinar today, so uh, uh, you know, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good morning, depending on uh, on where you are in the world. Um, we have a lot of experiences that we're going to share. Uh, this is a short list of the uh, 300 or so uh, country, uh, organizations that we have worked with in the past uh, in um, four or five different languages, uh, Arabic, Spanish, uh, French, uh, Vietnamese, uh, and, uh, and, and a few others. Um, so we have uh, we have some things to share, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started on that. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've done since we started uh, the Institute and the Strategy Management Group is we look for ways to simplify things. Um, you know, the, the space we're in, the performance management space, the strategic management space, uh, can get complicated real quick for folks who aren't in uh, our, uh, you know, our area of expertise. And so one of the things we found is it makes a lot of sense to simplify things as you're expanding the circle of people who, who, who need to get involved in the strategy side of the business. And it's not just the strategic planners. Um, our experience is uh, very much around uh, get, get everyone involved in, in making strategy <clears throat> happen in an organization if you want to be successful. So we like to divide things into groups so that we can manage it and talk about it and analyze it and discuss it. So a lot of the material you see coming out of the, the strategy management group in the Institute is, is organized in, uh, you know, in sort of a simple way so, so we can all uh, know what we're talking about and, uh, and go from there. So we like to think of the strategic management space as having four uh, really distinct categories. One is the, the discovery, you know, let's figure out what we're trying to do, who we are, what we want to be when we grow up. You know, we call that the strategic thinking phase. Then there's the planning phase, which is to tell our story, set our goals, tell the story of our organization. 
you know, how we're going to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. There's an alignment uh, category for engaging employees, <clears throat> processes, and technology, getting folks to uh, align with the uh, strategy. And then there's implementation, strategy, execution. And what we found is that by keeping things in those buckets and then making the connections, you know, among the buckets, uh, you can you can tell a story that's easy to understand, logically connected, uh, and there aren't very many chinks in the armor. Uh, it really does flow and people understand it uh, and it works pretty darn, darn good. Um, if you leave with one takeaway from this presentation today, uh, this is, uh, you know, sort of my favorite learning after having done this for 50 some years. Uh, if you want to make strategy, everybody's job, start with the end in mind. Stephen Covey really was right in his um, principles of leadership. Uh, memory serves. This was uh, principle number two, begin with the end in mind. You know, that's contrary to the way most of us think. We like to start with, uh, you know, some resources and a project plan and you know, a goal and, uh, you know, here's what I'm going to, uh, here's what I'm going to build, right? Um, that's, the, that's sort of the way we've been brought up, I think. But what we found is that if you change that paradigm and you start with what you're trying to accomplish first, the end point and work backwards, uh, you're going to have a much more solid organization, a much easier story to tell, uh, and you'll be uh, miles ahead of where you are if you start with all the projects you're currently working on. So number one takeaway, uh, don't work from left to right, work from right to left and start with what you're trying to accomplish and work backwards. So how does that work in practice? Well, you know, if you look at vision, mission and values, a, a picture, if you will, a conglomerate of our successful future, you know, I like to call that the 30,000 foot view uh, of things, high level, right? Mission, vision, values. You know, strategy is a, how do we get there? How do we get from point A, which is where we are now, to some desirable future? You know, so a, a strategy is a path and a plan for, for uh, achieving a successful future. Um, we like to use the, the balanced scorecard. Uh, it's proven very effective uh, over the years. So we call this a step, a balanced strategic plan, balanced enterprise strategic plan. You know, you're essentially deciding of all the options, things that you could do, you know, which one are we going to focus on? What are we going to say yes to? And equally important, what are we going to say no to? And that's what the strategy is, that, uh, that set of, uh, uh, of things that you're going to work on uh, with a path and with a plan. You know, going down in altitude, dropping down in altitude. If a, if a vision and mission and values are, are 10,000 meters, you know, strategy uh, might be uh, 7,000 meters, a business and support unit might be uh, 3,000 meters, and then we're going to get down to teams and individuals at, uh, at sea level. So the business and support unit operations are linked to the strategy. Uh, we call them strategic operating plans. So we want to write our operating plans based on the strategy of the enterprise. We want to make those connections. And the way we do it, uh, whether we're doing a balanced scorecard or, or any other framework, is to, to use strategic objectives. Strategic objectives are the the DNA of strategy, and they really form the basis for a successful uh, strategy uh, system for an organization. Once we, we have our business and support unit operations, we'll go to, drop down to teams and individuals. And that deals with, you know, how do I personally fit in and how does what I do matter to the organization's success? So looking at it through the eyes of, of our employees. So starting out with, uh, you know, some things that can go wrong in strategy formulation and planning, you know, we always like to ask ourselves when we do a baseline, you know, is it poor strategy? Is it poor implementation? You know, or, or some combination of both of those, right? There's, there's uh, three or four different things that this uh, could be. And some examples that we've seen of mistakes are a, a planning process that just seems to go on and on. And people lose interest in it, you know, it's not high energy. It's like... Uh, Oh, oh, shucks, we have to go through the planning process again. And it just sort of drags on. Uh, too much emphasis on planning rather than the results from planning. You know, too little focus on actually uh, uh, implementing what it is that came out of the planning process. We've seen a lot of plans that are a little more than a set of activities. You know, it's not focused on outcomes and results and accomplishments. The plan seems to be on here's a list of things that we want to do. 
That's not a strategy. That's a collection of things that we want to do. Uh, that's a big difference. Um, strategic plan is a set of initiatives, sort of makes the same point in, in, in different words. A lot of times uh, a planning document just uh, you know lists uh, some measures on initiatives and, and calls that uh, the, the strategy and the uh, goals and the measures for achieving it. Uh, accountability can be an issue in ownership, you know, hiding behind committees and, uh, and meetings and, and work rather than results. Uh, so as you're going through and building a system in, in your organization, you know, make sure that you worry about things like ownership. Uh, when we do balanced scorecard, for example, we would assign ownership to the strategic objectives. That starts to build individual accountability, but when you put all the objectives together into a strategy map, you have collective accountability for results. Uh, and that makes a huge difference in an organization. Poor communications, uh, Joe and I have seen this many, many times. You know, the folks at the top get it. Uh, I like to say the folks at the seventh floor understand what they're trying to accomplish, and maybe even the folks at the sixth floor who are direct reports. But then you go down to uh, floors five, four, three, two, and sea level and uh, ground level, and all of a sudden it's not clear at all. And more importantly, it's not clear how the folks, you know, really fit in and how what they uh, do really contributes. I remember we did some work at uh, the Susan Coleman organization in uh, Dallas, Texas, helped them build a balanced scorecard system some years back. And uh, one of the big takeaways for me was uh, on a video that they did following the, uh, the consulting engagement uh, where a, a young lady said, you know, I've been here for five years and I never really understood how I fit in. Now that we have a strategy map, and objectives I can relate and all the people who work to me can relate to exactly what it is and how we contribute to the, to the mission of uh, Susan Coleman. Uh, vision statement sounds nice. Boy, we have lots of those, <laughs> but can be open to different uh, interpretations, you know, plausible, but, uh, you know, words mean different things to different people. A lot of times we see no clear goals with those. Poor alignment, you know, we have a strategy at corporate and and it just sort of falls apart to below uh, the corporate or enterprise-wide level. The functions and departments really aren't hooking into the corporate strategy. They're operating as uh, islands doing uh, sort of doing their own things. Too many measures and too little information. Uh, one of the big advantages of going to a management system with a discipline like the balanced scorecard uh, is that you cut down the number of performance measures. You get to the measures that matter uh, rather than the measures that we can think of if we decide, let's just get measures. So those are some of the things that uh, that we have seen that sort of get in the way of good um, strategy execution. <clears throat> so let's talk about this uh, gap. Uh, it turns out it's pretty easy to write a, a, a good strategic plan. You know, it's pretty easy to get folks together to uh, uh, to talk about strategies and scenarios and and, and risk and all the things that go into creating the planning document, the, the, the discipline of strategic thinking, if you will. The hard part is the execution part. And so what uh, Joe and I have been working on for uh, the last five years is a course to try and put together uh, in a simple, practical way, some of the things that we have observed you can do uh, to help improve your chance of a successful high-performance organization. Uh, and we call these the strategy execution uh, imperatives. And we define strategy execution to be the systematic implementation of strategy through activities and processes that are aligned with the organization's mission and vision. You know, so how do we how do we bridge the gap? How do we get from the plan to successful uh, execution? We have grouped things into five major categories. Uh, the first one is foundational. Uh, it's called Engaged Leadership and Governance, and we're going to go into the details in, in each one of these in uh, just a minute. Alignment, aligning the organization and operationalizing the strategy is an imperative. Creating a performance culture, uh, transformation and change management, changing hearts and minds, uh, that's an imperative. Performance reporting, analyzing and informing folks with performance information that's used and useful. That's an imperative. And the last one is making project and portfolio management more strategic. Tying the projects, tying the portfolio projects to the enterprise-wide strategy or, or the organization so that folks at different levels in the organization see how they fit in and how what they do uh, makes a contribution. 
So these are the five uh, imperatives that are the basis of this um, webinar. Um, we've developed an assessment survey so you can baseline your organization. This is an example for the leadership and governance. Uh, it's in uh, SurveyMonkey. I believe uh, Candace has put the link in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A or the chat uh, uh, box of the, uh, of the Zoom webinar here. But what we've done is using a seven, uh, seven point Likert scale, uh, going from strongly disagree to strongly agree, we've listed a series of what we call components of the imperative. And there's you know, somewhere between five and eight usually components within each one of the imperatives as to uh, you know, the building blocks, if you will, of good leadership and governance by way of example. Uh, so go ahead and take that survey. That'll give your organization a good way of planning on the kinds of things you should do to make changes and eliminate gaps. Uh, so it's a really good way of uh, starting uh, off uh, a, a program of uh, improving performance in an organization. Um, we've got an awful lot of material. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Joe and I and uh, three other authors have created a new course called uh, Strategy Execution Professional Certification with, uh, with George Washington University, with our partners uh, that we're starting to teach uh, in uh, next month. It's uh, officially uh, on the roster now as a, a completed course, a certification course. It's four days. And there, there's an awful lot of material and there's a lot of uh, exercises and, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, conversations and uh, things that we do on a, on a, you know, during the workshop, during the uh, training workshops. So uh, Joe and I don't have time to do all of that in a one hour webinar. So what we've decided to do is for each one of the imperatives, we have uh, five major categories. We're gonna give you a statement of the purpose of the imperative then we'll list some issues and challenges. And we're only gonna highlight uh, one, one or two or three. There's a whole bunch more, but we just uh, don't have time if we uh, wanna allow some questions at the end of this to go into those. Uh, but again, the course deep dives into all of them. So uh, if you're interested in, um, in learning more, why please look into the course. Then we'll go to actions, uh, some things that we can do to improve performance. And then finally, we're gonna identify some tools, some techniques, some interventions that we have used, that others have used, uh, that produce results. So you're going to have a very practical way of getting from where you are to a more successful strategy execution in a disciplined way. That's the goal of this course. And then we'll finish off with, you know, what's the desired outcome that we want from this uh, imperative this statement of the outcome. So let's get started. Joe and I are going to switch off here, and I'll do one uh, imperative, then he'll uh, he'll jump in and do another, and we'll uh, tag team for uh, for the rest of the webinar. Uh, engaged leadership and governance, right? Senior leadership team provides active, personal, and visible leadership of the strategy. You know that's the purpose, right? That's what we want to see. Uh, some issues and challenges that we have seen: uh, strategy uh, that, that's lacking, right? Supporting the strategy is lacking. Strategy-focused leadership is lacking, and leadership and governance uh, shortfall. So just taking a few of these uh, bullets to dig into a little bit. Uh, senior leaders don't spend enough time uh, on strategy. Uh, Joe and I have seen many examples where you know, the leadership team uh, gives the strategy assignment to somebody else, the head of the strategic planning office, for example. You know, and they're really not interested. They're sort of doing it you know, sort of because they have to. Everybody... Everybody does one, so I guess we have to, and you know, we'll just put Frank in charge of that. They're not really uh, engaged, you know, beyond uh, the producing the, the the slick document that they can show everybody. Uh, on the board side, you know, we don't see boards actively engaged uh, in in strategy very much. They have a lot of responsibilities and roles. Sometimes there's conflicts, you know, between the senior leadership and the board as to what's the what's inside my fence. Or as Joe likes to say, what patch am I responsible for? We've seen conflicts there. Uh, some organizations have taken to actually put uh, a, uh, one of the board members in charge of uh, strategy with that uh, role and responsibility for uh, uh, you know, monitoring the, uh, the strategy of the organization. Um, so that's, a, that's one that, uh, that, that we've noticed, just not spending enough time on strategy, uh, not, 
not treating it with the seriousness that it deserves. Um, another one is vision, vision and mission and goals, not clear or well communicated. Uh, boy, do we see that a lot. Uh, we'll have a goal statement uh, at the top of the organization and on the seventh floor, and you go down to floor uh, five and below and ask people what the goal is, and uh, they're not sure. They talk about what they're currently working on, not how what they're currently working on ties into a uh, ties into a goal. A lot of times we'll see vision and mission statements that are just uh, words. I mean, it, it, uh, they don't seem to say a lot. They don't seem to, you know, uh, they, they don't engage people. You know, they don't uh, cause people to, they're not actionable, right? It's a, it's a set of words and there's no discipline around uh, what do we mean by a vision? What do we mean by a mission? You know, what's a goal? Uh, all of that stuff makes it very muddy for folks who are down, you know, below the seventh floor. And uh, so that's one thing that uh, we'll have some recommendations on how to fix leadership and governance shortfalls. Uh, we like to see roles and responsibilities uh, laid out so that it's clear, you know, where the line of the executive starts and where the line of the board stops. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the more time you spend on that with, and we have templates and things like that to help with that, uh, you know, the better, uh, the better it is. So we all know what our roles are and what our responsibilities are. Um, we had some uh, bad examples of that in the U.S. Uh, recently with the uh, banking uh, system, Joe, out on the West Coast, some banks that uh, failed, right? Uh, it, was, it was pretty clear that uh, the role and responsibility for, you know, fiduciary responsibility, uh, I think there was a lot of, uh, that's uh, that's Joe's problem. No, that's Howard's problem going on. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we that's not the only example of that. You see the ones that go really bad make... Uh, <clears throat> you know, make the San Francisco Chronicle or the Washington Post, but uh, there's an awful lot that don't rise to that level, but uh, still have still have issues. <clears throat> so some actions that you can take to improve performance. Again, I'm just going to highlight uh, one and, uh, and march on here in the interest of time. Uh, you know, what we're really looking for are leaders who, uh, who don't just talk, but who listen, you know, and who really walk the talk, right? They communicate up and down the organization with clarity. Uh, I'll go back to my example. When we did the work at Susan Coleman, the new CEO arrived. The first thing she did was have brown bag lunches with 430 employees, you know, in groups of four to 10. But she wanted to hear from them what's going on in Susan Coleman. Before she came in with lof lofty goals and objectives, she wanted to know what was, what was going on so that she had a, a much better understanding. So that's an example of the kind of, you know, let me walk, let me walk the talk. Let me make sure I understand before I tell you what to do. And uh, it's very, a very powerful uh, impact on employees when, when something like that happens. Tools, techniques, and interventions. Uh, we developed a maturity assessment uh, model. Joe's done a lot of work with that uh, over the last uh, couple of years. This model goes back maybe 20 years. We've used it all over the world. Uh, and it's a very good way of assessing the status of an organization's strategy maturity. You know, the management of strategy, the development of strategy, how mature is it in an organization? So that's a tool that we use. And of course, there's a lot of other things you can do, uh, coaching, you can do uh, racy matrices like we use in project management, goal setting uh, workshops and uh, <clears throat> something to improve uh, communications, communication workshops and communication uh, templates. Desired outcome, what are we looking for? Senior leadership drives and is fully involved in strategy execution, right? It's not just do as I say, it's I'm here with you, you know, down from the seventh floor down to the shop floor, you know, I'm, I'm involved and I'm engaged if I'm a leader in making this happen, making this stuff happen. Joe? Excellent, thanks, Howard. Uh, well, if you haven't gotten the uh, um, idea yet, from everything that Howard was talking about on leadership, uh, leadership got the process started to create the strategy and the performance management system, but leadership needs to maintain uh, that throttle uh, at full, full speed once they get the strategy out and it's been rolled out and starts taking uh, effect throughout the organization. Because the key thing that that's gonna do is gonna, the organization is gonna create a culture of performance and excellence in which the employees thrive. And we've had uh, instances uh, 
with many clients that once that get to this point, I think the, a lot of the employees wake up to the fact that this is the company is not going to be run business as usual anymore. And it's going to be set to a series of objectives, a set of key performance indicators. They're going to watch their project execution and, uh, and the communication that needs to go on throughout the organization. The first issue and challenge is performance culture shortfalls, tra change and transformation not incorporated into strategy. I like to tell clients and students in the classes I teach that this is not something that's hard to accomplish. Uh, in a little bit, you're going to see that we're going to talk about communicate uh, communication essentials that allows you to move the organization through the change process. And by the way, creating a strategy shouldn't come as no surprise and a performance management system, that's a change process in itself. And you've already seen uh, the slides Howard showed, and you can already see that communications fall uh, falls into this one. It's very interesting. Uh, there are three basic fault lines in strategy execution that unfortunately come about by natural circumstances. One is you heard from Howard, the leadership stops keeping their foot on the gas and keeping the things moving forward. The second is the organization or the leadership or leadership at all levels stops communicating to their uh, individual employees and their teams and individuals about the strategy. And the third is what I'll be covering on another imperative is the project management or portfolio management doesn't get the kind of structure and, and due diligence and, and dedication that needs to be done and uh, it becomes a, a fault line, as I, as I call it. Uh, communication, not informed and motivated about strategy and goals are something that we've noticed very easily. When you put a performance management system in place, which starts communicating on a regular basis through the intranet of your organization or internet, whatever you choose, and you can see it visually, it takes the entire organization takes on a different view of what's transpiring with the strategy. I remember one client, we got done with the strategy at the organizational level and uh, we you know, finished on one Friday and one of the weeks, came in on Monday, they had already put up flat panel screens over the elevator where you got on the elevator. So now while you're waiting, you can look up and see exactly what's transpiring, what are the objectives, what are, what are they trying to accomplish, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so performance management systems are not just performance management systems. They are a huge communications tool, which makes the strategy real because that people can see it on their phones. They can see it on their iPads. They can see it on their uh, terminals. Go to the next one, Howard. And um, if we look at the actions to and, improve, and to improve performance, this one is very critical. Uh, when you start the organization-wide strategy, there's a step in our process called the strategic theme teams. And those lower level individuals handpicked by the executive committee or the executive strategic management team, uh, they are the ones that are going to begin to put the strategy uh, down to the lower levels and uh, ask them what it should be for those strategic themes, which are focus areas of the organizations. Another way to look at themes are those th three or four activities that must be essential to the organization uh, making its way through its strategy uh, for success. In that, you're going to identify these change agents who are really on board uh, with their view of what the strategy is. Of course, now they've had a piece of the pie uh, in looking at what the strategy came out with, but they are also internal salespeople for the strategy. So you need to look inside your organization for who those change agents are. And the tools and techniques session, straight uh, section straight out. Uh, we published a strategy communications essential white paper earlier this year. And um, uh, the downloads have been significant. Uh, I use this in the training programs that I present and also consulting engagements. And really what it does is it keeps the strategist or the strategy management office on track with what needs to be communicated on a regular basis. A story I ran into with one client, we finished up doing their tier one, which is the organization wide strategy. And I left and I said, now you got to get going on your strategy communications 
uh, program. And when I came back, I said, well, how's it going? And they said, uh, well, we got it rolled out. We had a big rollout, the celebration and that. And I said, so, well, we're two months after that. So what about now? And then there was dead silence in the conference room. And I said, so what happened? They said, um, we didn't get the communications program running. And it's been two or three months now. And people are stopping us in the hallway saying, when are we going to hear about what's going on with the strategy? And that's not hard to do. So one of the things that uh, we're going to package up with the slides for this is a copy of that uh, white paper. And you're going to see it's not hard to get a communications plan in place and follow up throughout the year. Next slide, Howard. Yeah, do I, I'd add just one thing to the change agents. Recognize that we're not just looking for people uh, on the seventh floor. You know, you need change agents at every level of the organization. I like to say representing the different voices in an organization so that the language of the shop floor gets translated correctly and the language of the boardroom gets, gets translated correctly. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> so the desired outcome here is an organization that helps employees uh, that helps employees find a greater purpose, builds continuous improvement mindsets, and creates a dedication to the mission that drives performance. When you've accomplished this, every employee at all levels, when they come to work each day, are going to know exactly why they're there and what they're helping to accomplish for the organization. Good. Um, on alignment and operationalizing strategy, um, the, the, the purpose here is to get strategy that drives alignment and strategic and operating plans and budget that support the strategy. Uh, so a couple of major categories underneath that, corporate strategy is not translated into action. People and processes are not aligned to the strategy. Uh, Suboptimized business and support unit planning and operations and resource allocations and technology choices that are misaligned. So we see a lot of things that you can work on and, and fix uh, when it comes to the alignment imperative. Um, <clears throat> we've seen uh, operating units that act like silos. You know, they create their own plans uh, sort of independently uh, with little strategy guidance. Uh, our recommendation to overcome that is make sure that they write a purpose statement at the operating unit level, not a mission statement, not a vision statement, because uh, then they tend to uh, sort of uh, create new little uh, uh, satellite offices almost that may or may not be connected to the to the parent. Um, islands of activities, you know, how do I fit in is not uh, uh, is not uh, clear. Again, people are are worried about the activities that they're working on, not how what they do fits into the uh, to the bigger picture. <clears throat> um, little cross unit coordination. Uh, we've seen that uh, in, in several uh, uh, cases uh, where the uh, I mean, the units, you know, they, they need to work together. Right. And, and they just don't seem to find a way to to be able to do that. Uh, sort of like what's going on with the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress uh, at the moment. They just really have a hard time. Uh, working together. But if you want to be successful with a strategy, you know, it takes more than one operating unit, it takes more than one support unit. Uh, you really have to uh, make sure that there is alignment vertically and horizontally. And a lot of folks forget that. Uh, There's a very good uh, book uh, coming came out of uh, Harvard uh, some years back called The Horizontal Organization. And uh, essentially, uh, the book made the point that, you know, if you start with a with a customer accomplishment at the end and work backwards through the customer facing processes you know, that's a really good way of organizing a, an organization so that you keep your eye on the prize which is a satisfied uh, customer i think frank osteroff was the was the author of that uh, of that book uh, lastly no prioritization of projects with strategy uh, projects also take on a life of their own uh, and uh, folks uh, develop them at the level that they're at rather than looking up and saying, how is what I'm going to build, you know, fit in with the uh, with the strategy of the organization, plus a lot of other things that uh, we don't have time to uh, to go into. Some actions you can take incorporate strategy inputs, the unit operating plans and budget. Now, this usually takes the form of a guidance document that comes out of the enterprise wide uh, planning group might be a strategic planning office, maybe it's an SMO, maybe it's uh, just the group of executives, but some guidance that gets uh, you know, put in the language of the operating units and the support units, the business units, uh, so that they have guidance to write their own plans that are 
aligned with the uh, with the corporate view. On the tools and techniques, uh, an alignment checklist we've created uh, uh, that, that we share in the course, a template that you can use to um, help improve uh, alignment in your organization. Uh, one of my favorites is a two bullets down, a fishbone diagram, a Ishikawa diagram. Gives you a really good way of laying out from the customer, uh, satisfied customer, again, backwards through the different uh, processes, through the different uh, objectives, the things that you have to do to be successful to satisfy customers. Our desired outcome here, our business and support units that support the strategy with coordinated activities, efficient processes, budgets that support results uh, and engaged employees. All right. <clears throat> Moving on, you heard projects in the, in the last bullet uh, from Howard's part of the presentation for that imperative, and it jumps right into projects and portfolios are using a project or managed using a total enterprise systems approach. So one of the things that you can't get away from in strategy execution, you can't get away from it in strategy, build, building and execute and development. You're going to have to deal with the fact that projects and objectives need projects uh, associated with them to be successful. And it could be the simplest project that builds on itself on some type of tech, new uh, questionnaire, new type of uh, 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 type of uh, collecting data for any objective or KPIs that are in the system. And they just need to be scoped out and they need to be put through a process so that you have a document that says, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And this is the Gantt chart that we're gonna use to measure on time and on budget. And then it's gonna have its impact on the benefits of the organization going forward. Well, one of the problems that we see crop up every once in a while is there's no distinctions between strategic and operational projects. Let me give you a very good example. An organization that had about 200 and two, 235 uh, employees, when I'm moving through the consulting engagement, about a week or two before we start getting into the initiatives identification, and uh, I call for an inventory of all the projects that are on the books. What, how many, what projects are running? Uh, what projects have been, are in scoping? And what projects uh, just recently completed? We get in the room and the strategist uh, lead was tasked with getting the list together. And I said, okay, so what's the, you got the document on this? And they, he said, I'm ashamed to have to report that we have 185 projects on the books. That's in all three categories. And I listened and, uh, you know, there were a few groans and moans and I'm, I tried to make light of it saying, well, you got at least one person and every employee can be a project manager now and get the job done because you got 250 or 240 employees. But that's the problem is there was no separation between strategy projects and operational projects on that list where things like repaint the lines on the parking lot. I don't care about that. In a, in a strategic standpoint, that's an operational aspect. And so you have to really think about that through your scoping process. Where does that fall? And of course, strategic projects are attached to strategic objectives. The other one that we see a lot is that there's not enough resources. Well, of course, uh, you, you know, what is the rule of thumb? Basically, a project manager, a good project manager can handle between three and five projects. So that gives you pretty good bandwidth depending on your size of your organization. But if your organization is not that generous with the number of resources to manage, then you have to really get serious about how you're going to prioritize what those projects are and keep those uh, operational projects off the chart from a strategy, unless you're going to be combining them through something called a composite indice to measure how they're doing as well. The other thing, too, is there's a mismatch, inadequate resources and skills. This gets into the competency question. And we've seen a lot of scoping documents that have been developed, and they get finalized. And then finally, somebody says, well, where are the resources we have to put on this? And that's when they discover that they don't have the skill sets because it's a new technology that they're getting into. So it's got to be delayed. So these are all things with a good scoping process can be uh, flatten before it becomes a major problem going forward. Next one, so Howard. Now, 
the appropriate structure, enterprise management office, project management office, PMO, SMO, uh, that's the end game. When you fully aligned all the way across the organization, you need to migrate into one of these or both. A lot of organizations start with a small effort in PMO and, a, and, a, and of course, a strategy management office because you've got data to collect for KPIs. You've got communications to get out. you got to make sure that all that is refreshed on a regular basis. And consequently, you're, you're going to find yourself moving in this direction uh, because of the just sheer enormity of the number of elements that you're going to have to be tracking and being responsible for. And the best tools and technique uh, that you know we use is giving them a, a sample or a template for a project charter. Sometimes when I use the term scoping, I can tell right away with the response in either the corporate level or the department level, they're, they're, they're an organization that's not used to the structure and the diligence and the focus that you need to put on projects and the project charter uh, or scoping document helps you get started with that. Next, Howard. And the end outcome here is projects produce desired benefits through a more st strategy focused to alignment, consistency in project management and leadership driven project portfolio governance. Mainly because every project's not gonna be the same length. You're gonna have to have a process to keep that pipeline full. And many organizations, unfortunately, always have more projects than they have resources, both money and people to put in, but this helps structure it uh, going forward. Our okay. uh, performance information reporting and analysis is an imperative. And here we're looking for performance information that's used and useful, right? It provides valuable insights into management decisions. Uh, a lot of times when we visit organization and we ask to see the KPIs, uh, it is literally just a list of uh, the answer to a question. Let's come up with some KPIs, and folks just uh, you know sort of do a mind dump of uh, things that that want to be measured. Uh, but when you ask them, you know, well, how do these relate to the organization goals, or you know, which ones are strategic and which ones are operational, which ones are projects, which ones are behavioral, uh, you know, you get sort of blank stares. Uh, here's our measures, kind of an answer. Um, again, if you start with the end in mind. You'll start by asking yourself, uh, what do we need to do to be successful? You know, question two is, how will we know we're going to be successful? Question three, how are we going to measure progress along the way? You know, that's the way to sort of think about getting to uh, strategic uh, KPIs, <clears throat> which are the ones that are usually missing in an organization. Uh, again, you know, don't start a KPI effort by asking the question, what KPI should we use? Uh, you will end up in uh, in the wrong place uh, based on our experience. Uh, performance reporting is not taken seriously. You know, it's uh, I, I did my measures. I checked my box. Now let me get on with my real job, kind of an attitude. Uh, we see a lot of uh, of that where performance reporting just really doesn't get the, um, you know, the, the emphasis, the importance uh, that it really deserves. Uh, we see a lot of performance that games, that is gamed. You know, I don't want to use that measure because that might... Uh, cause the alarm to go uh, red. You know, I don't want people to know about that one. Uh, so again, if, you, if you're gonna do um, a due diligence on performance measures, make sure that you start with a workshop, make sure you start with what you're trying to accomplish and sort of work your way backwards from that to identify using, you know, a performance stethoscope kind of an analogy. Where do I have to measure things to make sure that I'm making progress toward the, uh, toward the end goal? Some actions, you know, decide what you're trying to accomplish first. I've mentioned that several times. Then measure what matters within that uh, within that context. Uh, some tools, uh, we've come up with something called a data definition table, which we use around the strategic objectives, which is a very powerful way of getting, you know, what's the frequency, the units of measure, what's the description, what's the formula, all the attributes that you need uh, around a KPI to, to, to be disciplined about the uh, about the process. Uh, we've also developed a performance measurement model, the MPRA, uh, that we use uh, regardless of whether you're doing a balanced scorecard. This is a standalone model that allows you to do exactly what we're talking about here. Start with the end in mind and measure what matters. 
uh, along the way. Desired outcome, uh, we want performance evidence-based information uh, that's used and useful and helps inform decision-making, right? It's of no use to uh, go through all this trouble to collect, you know, report, uh, organize, uh, visualize, uh, if we're not gonna use it to help inform decision-making. So that's really the, uh, the end goal of uh, performance measurement. We're gonna open it up to questions here uh, in, in a minute or two. Um, so what are some best practices that Joe and I have observed? It really helps to create a strategy map and help an organization visualize the strategy. Uh, you know, you need, you need a visual representation of, uh, of, of what you're trying to accomplish and the path and the plan that you're using to do it. Uh, strategy map, uh, probably one of the best contributions I've seen to management science uh, in the last uh, two or three decades. It is really that powerful a, uh, a tool. Communicate strategy with clarity, right? A communication workshop is a really good way of talking about what's the message, who's the messenger, what's the media, what's the timing, Make sure you have a disciplined way of crafting a message for the different voices in the organization and the external audience that's aligned, that's linked, that makes sense. So everybody gets on the same train with regard to what are we doing and how are we going to do it? Communicating with clarity. Uh, measure strategic results, right? And report on progress, not just reporting on uh, projects, not just reporting on activities. Um, strategic, <laughs> excuse me, strategic results. Make sure we prioritize our projects with a contribution towards strategy, uh, align the organization around strategy. You know, strategy is the common thread that makes all this work. Uh, it really does. It's, uh, it's another major contribution to management science is to think about strategy as the thread that goes through the organization that allows you to hook other things to it you know, that, that aren't strategy in and of themselves, but you take the whole structure and, and you have a, a workable uh, strategy with employees on board, efficient processes that support the strategy uh, and the technology choices that are not isolated events. I, we were doing a job for a major client in uh, California, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the major technology players. And uh, in one of the workshops, we come to find out that uh, in the sales cycle, they were using three different databases to collect information about potential uh, clients, and they didn't talk to each other. You know, when we got different people in the room because of the way we organize our workshops, we want different voices in the room, not just everybody who knows the same thing. They were all sort of aghast that this <laughs> group had a, had, a, had a database and this group had a database, and they wondered why they had to go to three different databases to get a full picture of a potential client. Uh, rewards and incentives, right? Uh, add a boys and add a girls go a long way to improving uh, performance. It's not just about uh, giving everybody more money. Uh, recognizing good work uh, goes a uh, goes a very long way to uh, uh, helping with strategy execution. Um, many of you know us, right? We help organizations uh, formulate, communicate uh, strategy, uh, align organizations prioritize and manage projects and uh, measure uh, and analyze uh, and help people uh, improve uh, performance. Um, we've trained over 12,000 delegates uh, to date in the last 20 years in uh, strategy, strategic planning, balanced scorecard, OKR, KPI, project management and uh, leadership and execution. And uh, we've consulted in uh, many languages, over 300 organizations now. With clients in over 80 countries, so we're uh, we're pretty proud of what uh, we've been able to accomplish. We make a difference, and uh, the organizations uh, we help tell us that we make a difference. Um, strategy execution training is new. Joe and I have been I'm embarrassed to tell you, working on it for about five years, and uh, we finally uh, have uh, have been able to uh, to release it in our first the course. It'll be online November 6th through 9th, and we're going to have a bunch of additional dates in 2024. We'll do live classes uh, so far in English. We'll probably translate into uh, Arabic uh, next uh, in uh, 2024. And you can learn more at the um, web uh, address uh, down, uh, down below. Uh, we also do, uh, obviously, strategy execution consulting. And you'll find a full range of our services on the uh, 
strategymanagement.com website. Thank you for attending, everybody. Hopefully you've learned uh, something you can use on uh, uh, back in your organization. And um, we are glad to open it up for uh, at least a few questions. Uh, yep. Sounds good, Howard. Uh, good questions came in. So let's start with uh, Alita. She says, my agency has created a strategy but does not leverage the document to effect effectively manage priorities, often forgetting the key initiatives defined in our by our strategic planning process and spending more time fi fighting fires. Sorry, sorry, Alita, that's a common one. Can you recommend steps to course correct? You want to take a shot at that one, Howard? I would, uh, the first couple of words caught my attention, Joe. I would take the focus off the document and I would start a meeting, not with the document, but what is it, even if it's not in the document, what it is that we're trying to do this fiscal year, for example, right? What are our priorities? You know, do we have a political overlay on those uh, priorities or are these just projects that have continued for some time? I mean, I, I literally, I, I don't mean this in the wrong way. I literally forget about the document because the plan is only as good as the time that it was created. And what matters next is the goal, right? Uh, impediments to achieving the goal. And if you can tie the initiatives that you have to, to solving problems, it's a much easier sell. People often ask me, how do you sell this stuff to an executive? And I say, I, there's two ways that you can do it. You can either talk about how a strategic management system can help you capture benefits that you can't get in other ways, or it can help you alleviate pains that keep you up at night and affect your sleep. So if you look at it from the point of view of what are the benefits we're going to get from the goals that we've set ourselves for our citizens, for the warfighter, whoever your your customer quote is, you know, and then work by, work work from that. This initiative supports this in the following way. In other words, don't make an argument by vigorous assertion. We have to do this because we've set the initiative. Make the argument through the benefit side or through the pain alleviation side. Yeah, Howard, I would add on this one, I, I hear this one quite a bit uh, in classes and with clients. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is a strategy execution cadence uh, that really spends time focusing on the initiatives and the projects, because those are the things that tend to get off the rails uh, for whatever reason. And there's a much higher frequency of review monthly, at least, uh, on those and then having a, a quarterly reviews of the whole strategy at both the tier one, which is organization wide and tier two, which is the department. And then he finally spending time in the fourth quarter doing a deep dive on all of that content and all those, uh, um, everything across the organization at the end of the year or at the budgeting process that co coordinated with the budgeting process. Right. And so that everybody knows exactly what is working what's not working, what needs interventions, and the budget process knows if those initiatives are going to have to have an uh, uptick in their budgets. How about uh, Shom said, uh, what are your thoughts on integrating balanced scorecard with OKR? You want me to jump in here first on that one, Howard? <laughs> well, I, you know, OKR is, is, uh, is another way of doing performance measurement, isn't it? Yeah. So you can... Um, they're they're internally consistent. Once you get strategic objectives, you know you can use the traditional. Uh, you can use a logic model, process improvement model. There's there's plenty of tools to go from a strategic objective to a set of performance measures. You know, and, and OKRs. I mean, is a way of just organizing that and getting more quickly. You know, to the to the objectives and the key results, right? So, but start with the objectives, and then uh, you know choose whether you want. Uh, uh, quick, you know, OKRs and the, and the advantages of that reporting, uh, that, uh, you know, more frequent reporting, or if you want a more traditional way of setting it with a, with a KPI workshop and, and doing it that way. I mean, I see them as complementary, you know, not competitive. I see the balanced scorecard as, as really helpful on setting strategy and, and, and giving you a roadmap on how you're going to accomplish that strategy. And then OKRs with giving you that set of uh, uh, you know what are what do we wor what do we worry about today in the next week in the short term to, to get our successes? How do we measure what matters? They're, they're complementary. Yeah, it's interesting. This year, Howard, I've had a couple of clients uh, that we've engaged with that 
tried OKRs, and they, they gave it a good runway, uh, at least two, three, four quarters, and uh, they discovered that it wasn't their cult, didn't fit their culture, and and Howard mentioned it, but you know, their OKRs by their essence are short term, so that kind of says that your business rhythm or your momentum or your change or your churn of what's happening has got to be at a certain level uh, that uh, supports OKRs versus the traditional SMART goals attached to uh, SMART objectives for individuals and teams. Let's talk about um, Ganesh. Ganesh said, sirs, do you have any specialized course for learning tools and techniques mentioned under each imperative? Howard? Yeah, well, that's this new strategy execution professional four-day certification course. Uh, you'll be jointly certified by uh, George Washington University and by us. Um, one thing I'd mention about that course that I didn't say before, what you're going to get out of it is a, is a roadmap for your organization. The deliverable for you is not just the learning, but in each one of the imperatives, we create a, uh, a set of action steps. We call the whole thing a roadmap uh, that you create based on what you're learning and your discussions with other folks in the room. So when you go back to your organization Monday morning, uh, you know, or Sunday morning, you've got something to show that represents, you know, here's a plan, a starting point for how we can improve strategy execution in our organization. It's called a strategy execution roadmap. And it's going to be the key deliverable out of the course. Yeah, Custom, and how, and how are you, organizations. yeah, and you mentioned, and we had a slide in there that talks about the, you know, the base course for the strategy balance scorecard, course for the KPI development, uh, course for, uh, we even have some courses for project management fundamentals, and then, of course, the strategy execution course. Yvonne uh, Yvan said, do you think it is necessary in this time of huge technological development to have a main box for digital transformation as a main strategic objective? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, in other words, if you think of, remember Joe mentioned the strategic themes, those are the vertical pillars of excellence. They're the load bearing walls of the management house that you're building. And at the end of each one of those themes is a strategic result that can be measured. And we usually recommend three or four of those. So they become the three or four strategies or focus areas or themes, whatever you wanna call them, uh, that your organization is built on. That's a vertical component. And then the floors of the house are the perspectives in the balance scorecard, right? The customer, the financial or stewardship, if you're nonprofit processes and uh, organization uh, capacity, uh, what Kaplan and Norton calls learning and growth. Those are the vertical slice. So another way to, to ask the question is, you know, is digital transformation vertical or is it horizontal or is it both? And I guess, you know, to answer the question, you need to know what kind of organization uh, you're really talking about. I don't think there's one right answer is the short answer to the question, because you could handle that either as a theme in a high tech company. It might be a theme. Uh, you could add it in as a part of a, uh, a part of a um, um, perspective. For example, improving our processes might be tied to digital transformation or you could make it an objective. So I think you have really three choices. And that's, you know, when we facilitate these workshops, that's where the good stuff happens. You know, it's not so much in the framework, even though that's disciplined and, and we like it a lot. Um, it's, the, it's the integration of the voices in the room that really get to answers to those kind of questions that are the right answer for your organization. Rather than give you a school solution answer, that's the way to do it. Get yourself a group of smart folks not, not who all just necessarily talk to each other, but who represent different processes, different voices in the organization, and have some deep conversations about just something like that, right? Make yourself a list of tough questions at the start, put those to that group, and you'd be absolutely amazed at what comes out of a one or two or three day workshop. Make sure it's facilitated, whether by us or by somebody else, better externally than internally. And you'd be amazed what comes out at the back end of a, of a workshop like that. Yeah, that's good. Howard, about that, uh, you have the, the organization has to decide for itself where the focus is. Right. And uh, an exa a similar example that I ran into with one client that had three lines, of three organizations, three lines of business, 
uh, feeding up into a holding company. And it turns out when we worked on a strategy for the three lines of business, they all had an objective called supply chain management, improved supply chain management. And then lo and behold, after they uh, studied it, after we finished, they called up and said, we've come to the conclusion that this needs its own balanced scorecard. This is big enough and wide enough in the organization because it's lifeblood to what they do because they're heavy manufacturing. And lo and behold, we created one and now it's its own scorecard in, in conjunction with the, uh, the, the organization-wide scorecard. Uh, we've come to the 11 o'clock hour here, Howard, and uh, what we'll do is we'll, we've got all of these questions captured and Howard and I will gen up some answers to those uh, going forward and uh, make them available uh, as a part of the uh, download uh, that you can get from the uh, website. I wanna thank you from my perspective uh, about this strategy execution business. It's interesting because I've found over the years and the many strategies that I built before I came to the Institute and the strategy management group and the ones I've helped clients do now, it takes extreme focus. You have to stay focused on it uh, because you're building something here that's going to get into the DNA of the organization going forward. You have to keep your focus on the measures and make sure that you're, it really comes down to are, are your measures telling the story of your objectives that you've created? You need to keep that scorecard or whatever uh, visual or graphic you have that describes what the strategy is about visible and, and keep it up up in everyone's face as much as possible. And you have to come to the realization that this whole process is all about design, defining accountability going forward. Howard? Yeah, thanks. I just remind everybody that you know strategy execution is not uh, about balanced scorecard. It really stands alone as a separate function, regardless of which management system you're using, or even if you're not using a formal management system. Uh, you really have to think about how do I implement the stuff that is important to implement in an efficient and an effective manner. And that's the way we've approached the course. It's not a, a balanced scorecard add-on course. It's really about uh, uh, sharing the things that we've learned over, over many years of doing this stuff and helping you create your individual uh, uh, organization roadmap. I thank you. Uh, as you can tell, Joe and I like to do these things. We like to share. <laughs> We're probably educators and problem solvers at heart and have been uh, uh, have been our whole lives. So uh, thank you for uh, attending and uh, we wish you well in uh, your endeavors. Call us if you need us. Thank you.